Hi everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for our live Q&A on interpersonal relationships this evening. Um, so for the next hour or so, we'll be talking about some new research on interpersonal relationships in adults who are born with a cleft, going through what this means for the CLAFA community and how services can be improved in the future. So there'll be time towards the end of the session for us to take some questions from viewers. So if you've got a question, please feel free to write it in the live comments and we'll try to answer as many as we can later. Um, before we get started, we'll introduce ourselves. So I'll start. Um, and I'm the communications officer at Clapper. So I work on the charity's social media, graphics, website, newsletters and things like this. Um, so Kenny, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Kate. Um, so yeah, my name is Kenny. I'm the Adult Services Manager here at Clapper. Um, and I've been in charge of the Adult Services Project over the last three years, um, including uh, doing the research, which I'm really excited to share with you this evening, um, as well as designing and delivering the services that we put in around that that came out of the research as well. Great, thank you, Kenny. Um, yeah, and I, I think I forgot to say my name as well. So I'm Kate, the communications officer. Um, so let's start with quite an important question. Um, so what was the motivation for researching interpersonal relationships in adults who were born with a cleft? Yeah, this is a really good question. Obviously, we know from previous research done by our partners at the Centre for Appearance Research in Bristol. So we've worked very closely with them on this project and they've helped immensely with the, the research side of things. Um, but they've actually been doing this long before we have. Um, and they found, as well as international research across Europe and beyond, that interpersonal relationships are a really important topic for people born with a cleft. Um, um, this isn't rocket science class. We all know that our ability to have good, healthy relationships with other people is fundamental to our enjoyment of life and how we view and see the world. Um, we know from the previous research that relationships with family, friends, partners, boyfriends, girlfriends, strangers, etc., can all be influenced in both positive and or negative ways by cleft. And we wanted to better understand what that was looking like for adults living in the UK in the kind of late 2018, you know, 2020 sort of era. Great, thank you for that introduction. Um, so the research paper is based on the results from Clapper's 2018 whole of life survey. Um, can you tell us a bit about the survey and the topics it included, as well as how the results were collected? Yeah, of course. So some of you who are listening and watching to this, to, watching this tonight will remember taking part in the survey. And if you did, first of all, a huge thank you, um, because none of this would be possible without the 250 plus people who so generously gave up their time to complete the survey. Um, and it was a very comprehensive survey as well. So it consisted of over 200 questions and was called the whole of life survey. And we collected so much information from the survey and we've actually reported it across five journal articles, produced four lay summaries, and we'll be doing four Q&As, of which this is number three of four. Um, we asked the obvious stuff, so what treatment you had, how you found that, whether you um, would go back for further treatment, what your experiences with your surgeon, your dentist, orthodontist, speech therapist, etc., were like. Um, but we also asked some other things, um, that perhaps the connection to cleft may not have been immediately obvious. So we asked you about your emotional well-being, your education experiences, your work experiences, um, whether you'd experience bullying and discrimination, as well as about your relationships with friends, family, romantic relationships, attitudes towards having children, those sorts of things. Um, and people had a choice as to whether they completed the survey online or used a paper booklet. Most people chose to, to complete it online. And we had a very good spread of different ages as well. So, um, you know, people right from kind of early adulthood right up to people in their, their 60s and 70s completing the survey. So we had a real breadth of different people um, and a reasonably good distribution of, of men and women. Like it's very typical when you do this sort of um, survey that you get more women than men, which, which we did find. Um, but not terribly so. Like we had a pretty good, good mix. So we're pretty confident that what we found um, speaks for a, a reasonable cohort of people who were born with cleft. 
Brilliant. Um, so the findings suggest that while adults feel comfortable in their existing friendships, engaging in new friendships is something that many did still find difficult. Um, so many also felt inexperienced when it comes to dating and intimacy. Um, what are some explanations for these feelings? Yeah, so there's a, a lot to unpack here. So just, just bear with me as I kind of go, go through because it you're really asking two or three questions there. Um, but first of all, it was great to see so many people reporting that they're pleased with their friendships. This is what we would hope for, for everybody. Um, it does also mean, make sense that people may still find it difficult to make new friendships. Um, cleft will be one factor in this, which perhaps makes people feel a bit more introverted than maybe they otherwise would have been. Um, but it is important important to remember um, that people would naturally have either been introverted or extroverted regardless of whether they've had a cleft or not and that has some bearing on how you make make friendships. Um, I think though the common theme that came through here was one of being a bit wary when making first impressions and fearing judgment or discrimination um, because of their appearance or their speech. Um, and sadly, that can become a bit of a vicious cycle where you fear judgment, so you don't approach people, and therefore you're perceived as shy, and then so people in turn don't approach you, so then you do feel like you've been, been rejected. Um, so there is a vicious cycle. Um, when it comes to dating, you're right, many people reported that they found this difficult. Um, I don't actually know that anyone, cleft or not, finds dating particularly easy, um, but it does definitely seem to be harder if you've got a condition such as cleft. Um, I guess that romantic relationships and dating feels even higher stakes again than, than friendship. Um, I mean, after all, you're hoping to find someone who you can be totally your whole self with. And so therefore, the fear of rejection is even higher when it comes to, to dating. Um, and I guess there's more that somebody might reject you on in a, a kind of um, dating scenario than they might in a friendship scenario. Um, it is worth it bearing in mind that a lot of people, most people, have actively experienced this rejection at a younger age, perhaps at high school, where they may have been on the receiving end of some quite petty behaviour. Um, I know I've experienced that myself. And then naturally that impacts on your confidence later on in life. Um, for most people growing up and going through adolescence, um, you know, cleft or, or not, um, they will experience dating at school and, you know, the casual on again, off again, relationship development in all its awkward glory. Um, one of the recurring themes we've seen with our cleft population is that they essentially skip that stage in their teens and then they go get straight into dating in their 20s. Now, obviously, when you're in your teens, that rejection and incompatibility is experienced by everyone. Um, and generally speaking, um, teenage relationships aren't quite so serious, even though they may very much feel like it at the time. Um, but once you get a bit older, these things do feel a bit more serious. And so going into dating in your 20s for the first time um, could feel much more daunting if you don't have those other experiences to kind of put some of that, you know, rejection and incompatibility into perspective. I guess it can feel a lot more, more personal than it perhaps should. Um, and of course, just kind of skipping that teenage phase um, also led to people reporting being quite sexually inexperienced, um, as they've not experienced sexual intimacy in their teens either, which, which is worth pointing out. Many people haven't, but of course, society likes to paint a picture that everyone except you is doing it all the time. They're not. Um, so some people also reported being anxious about their body's appearance or how it functions during intimacy and, and sex and things like kissing as well. Um, again, these are understandable worries, but they do get in the way of people being able to enjoy these things and can, can become a self-fulfilling prophecy if you're worrying about it all the time. Um, most people agreed that, which I think is a really important point to make, that once they reached adulthood, once they got through those awkward teenage years, it was actually the lack of confidence or being shy rather than their appearance or their speech that impacted on their dating. And I think that's quite an important distinction to make. Um, it's very much supported by the fact that I've spoken to many partners of people with cleft 
including my own, and they just don't see cleft as a major thing. But of course, in our own heads, it can feel strange to think that other people see past it or don't even see it at all, um, but they really don't. You know, Probably the best piece of advice I could give here, um, even if it does sound a bit of a cliche, is to stop comparing yourself to other people. You know, it's not helpful. It's not a fair comparison anyway, um, as you know, anyone you're comparing yourself to will have their own insecurities that you don't see. Um, the other thing, of course, in any relationship, you know, be it um, a romantic relationship or, you know, a friendship or relationship with your family is communication. Um, in the romantic context, if you don't ask, generally speaking, you don't get. So try not to be afraid of rejection. It's quite a normal part of dating. And it just takes you one step closer to finding someone who likes you as much as you like them. Um, and then once you are with a partner, hopefully you trust them enough to share any concerns you might have about intimacy or your perceived, perceived inexperience. Um, again, if they're the right person for you, they will support you with this. Um, and on that note, a number of people rather concerningly said that they were staying with their partner who was not ideal for them out of a fear of not being able to do any better. I mean, I'm sure I don't need to spell out why that's quite problematic. And obviously nobody deserves to to feel or to be abused or to feel unloved in a relationship. Um, leaving a difficult relationship can be really hard, but the evidence would certainly tell us that it isn't worth sticking out a bad relationship in the hope that it will get better. Sadly, they don't tend to, um, and you deserve better than that. Um, again, I reiterate my point, the right person for you will always have your back and will support you all the way. Definitely. Um, and I'd just like to say hi again to everyone watching and thank you for joining us. I can see some nice highs in the comments. Um, and just a reminder that if you do want to share anything or ask any questions in the comments, you're really welcome to do that. Um, feel free and we'll get to as many as we can later. Um, so on to the next question. Um, so this paper raises some difficult questions and issues surrounding bullying and discrimination. Um, would you mind um, sort of expanding on the findings and the implications here. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, it does make for some sobering reading to realise that so many people experience bullying and discrimination. Um, sadly, you know, I'm not particularly surprised by this from kind of doing the work that I've been doing for the last few years. Um, you know, talking to people it, it doesn't overly surprise me, but it, it is a shame. You know, it's something that shouldn't be happening. Um, we know the world that we live in has a lot of inequities and inequalities. And in recent times, we've seen big groups of people who have been, you know, on the receiving end of bullying and discrimination for a long time, um, stepping up and saying that things have to change. And we've seen that in big ways. We've seen big protests. We've seen big social movements, which is really encouraging. Um, Unfortunately, though, that momentum isn't quite there in the same yet same way yet for visible difference such as CLEF. Um, and so in the same way that it is with some of these, these big other social justice movements, the thing that has to change is society's attitude. Um, yes, there's, there's some things that we can take responsibility for. So we can do education and we can provide a lot of support to people who are, you know, the victim to bullying or discrimination. But it does really feel to me like in doing all that, we're being the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff rather than the fence at the top, you know, and we've got a really good ambulance. We've got, you know, you can go to the cleft team and you can get support from the cleft team psychologists with regard to bullying and discrimination. And they're excellent. They, they deal with us all the time and um, they know the supports that, that work. Um, we've got a great peer support service here at Clapper who can provide support. Um, but I think the elephant in the room here is that we'd all like to see that these things don't happen in the first place and that it's not okay that they do and so calling people out on bullying behaviors you know making sure your workplace and places where you might volunteer your time support and values diversity in a meaningful way and that means supporting all groups of people not just because one group is trendy and have, has a lot of attention on them right now but supporting all groups of people because that's the right thing to do and that includes disability and difference as well um 
Another concern that I had when looking through our data was realizing that a number of people didn't believe that they'd been bullied or discriminated against, but then they went on to describe things that happened to them, which we would definitely identify as discriminatory or, or abusive. Um, so that raised another really important point for me that we need to make sure that people realize that they deserve better. And just because something has always been a certain way, it doesn't mean that it always should be. Yeah, definitely. Um, so on to a slightly different kind of question. Um, the research showed that most people, or 64% of people, felt that having genetic testing to know their chance of having a child with a cleft was important. Um, can you just kind of explain a bit about what genetic testing is and roughly how it works? Yeah, definitely. So um, it's probably important to provide a bit of context actually around um, why we were asking that, that question. Um, so we gave people the information um, that, you know, when you've been born with a cleft, um, there is generally um, then a somewhat genetic component. Um, and I'll explain a bit more about that um, as I give an answer to what genetic testing is. Um, but therefore, you know, knowing what your likelihood is of, of passing cleft on could be quite important to people when they get to the point where they're thinking about having children. Um, so we did give everyone that that information. Um, so now I'm a speech language therapist by background, so this really isn't my area. But fortunately, we have got an excellent cleft talk podcast uh, with Margot Whiteford, who is a retired geneticist in the Glasgow cleft team, and she explains this really well. So. I would encourage you, you know, if you want to find out more information on this topic, um, go to clapper.com forward slash cleft talk and select episode two for more information. Um, but to give you a brief overview, genetic testing is, like I said, it's designed to help you understand the probability that your children might be born with a cleft. Um, so we know that no single factor causes cleft, rather it is a combination of different things. Um, and I, I've heard it be described like having a glass of marbles, you know, and if you can picture a glass of marbles, some are bigger, some are smaller, and each of these marbles in that glass is either a genetic factor or an environmental factor. And your partner will also have their own glass of marbles. And then when you have a child, you add your two glasses of marbles together into a third glass, and that third glass is your, your child's glass. Um, now, if when you add your marbles together, you don't fill the glass, then your child doesn't have a cleft. But if they do and it tips over the edge, then the threshold has been reached and a cleft would occur. Um, so basically, when we think about the general population, everybody's walking around with some factors for cleft. Um, just some people will have more than others. So even people who, who don't have cleft could actually be you know, have a lot of marbles in their glass and be right on the tipping point for developing a cleft if there were another environmental or genetic factor at play. Um, whereas other people actually might be walking around with very low levels of marbles in their, their glass. And that's the thing we just don't know about people to look at, look at them, because if they don't have a cleft, um, then, you know, we can either assume it's you do or you don't, but actually it, it's a range of, of different factors. And that's the same with many, many health conditions. Um, so, you know, genetic testing will then help you and your partner understand what marbles you each bring to the table. Um, they usually do this by simple blood tests and saliva tests. Um, the counselling side of things is then done with a clinical psychologist, and it helps you understand what to do with that information. Um, because, and to make sense of it all, because, you know, knowing your probability is one thing. So, you know, if you've been told you've got a certain probability of having a child be born with a cleft, what does that then actually mean for you when it comes to making decisions around having children? Um, and they'll help you be better prepared for whatever happens. Um, because obviously how you might respond to being told you have a one in four chance of having a child with a cleft could be very different to how you might prepare if you were told you've got a one in 50 chance, for example. Um, does that sort of answer that, that question? Yeah, very well, I think. Um, but if that hasn't, if anyone wants to know a bit more, then feel free to write a comment in the live comments. Um, 
So the next question I wanted to ask was, are there any findings which you think would benefit from future research? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely opportunities for further research here. Um, it would be really interesting to see, you know, how what we found differs across age groups, um, if there's any differences accounting for gender and, and that sort of thing. Um, like I said, we got a really good spread of people across ages and, and gender and, um, you know, different demographic points. Um, but generally with kind of 250-ish people it sounds like a lot and it would be a lot if we put them all in a room together but actually it's quite difficult to separate um what people said by age or gender um and then be left with a large enough group to infer that that's what people who are in their 60s think as opposed to that's what the three people who were male in their 60s for example um thought so it, it becomes you know harder once you make those numbers smaller um so it'd be really interesting you know in a much larger study to see how these these things compare and the way to do that may be um to have a study that solely focuses on relationships for example um rather than in the context of a much larger study that takes up a lot more of people's time um I would also really like to see an international comparison here as well to see if there are things that are unique to the UK or if this is as common across the board. Um, I think it's probably reasonable to see that we would expect some cultural differences there between perhaps, you know, the UK and maybe the US might might be a bit different. Um, and then the Far East as well, you know, and, and parts of Asia and things where societal attitudes are, are different again, perhaps towards um, how cleft is viewed um, and therefore potential kind of, you know, bullying, discrimination behaviors and stigmas that might be around relationships. Um, you know, given we're seeing a lot of this in the UK, which is generally a pretty accepting country, a, a reasonably tolerant country. Um, I think we can imagine that there are places in the world where, you know, we may be seeing, you know, an even stronger picture of people reporting that they're, they're bullied or discriminated against, um, or that they feel they can't get what they're after in a relationship that they've got to accept something different. So I think it would be really interesting to see a comparison there. Um, I think it would also be really interesting to find out more about people's attitudes towards having children. Um, we really only touched on this given how large the survey already was, um, but I think there's a lot of scope to explore that further. There's a lot of international research on this, but to be honest, it's mostly from the 70s and 80s. Um, and I think, you know, things have changed generally in the world since then. And, and so I think it's worth, worth revisiting. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd also just like to come to a question from the comments now. Um, someone just asked a um, polite question, but is does a cleft um, count as a disability? And actually, a few I think a few people have answered this anyway, but I just wondered if you might expand on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's a really interesting point because it depends really on on how you interpret that. Um, I think in terms of, you know, technically speaking, in the, the eyes of the law, you know, the answer would, would be yes. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that um, fall under the kind of disability category, and there are certainly times in somebody's life with cleft where, you know, they need that sort of extra assistance, particularly with things like, like feeding or, or speech. And, and things like that, where compared perhaps to somebody who doesn't have cleft, um, it, there is an element of disability there, at least at some point in time. Usually with cleft, that get, gets resolved. Um, I know there can be a lot of stigma about using the word, so I'm quite, quite careful to use it. I know that it empowers some people and some people choose not to be identified by it. I think that's really important um, that people make that distinction for themselves as to whether they identify as part of the disability community or not. What I will say is that I think, you know, the word disability clearly is stigmatized and we we see that coming through. Um, and we know actually that people in the 
who are in the disability community receive a lot more discrimination than any other group. So that that you know is a higher proportion of discrimination um, than you know women experience or um, people of color experience. It's a really high proportion, and that that is particularly concerning. Um, but but yeah, so I mean, technically, on a legal level, it would be considered a, a disability. Um, I know, you know, thinking about my own experiences, I would say um, that comes and goes with time. Like there are definitely times where I feel that cleft has had more of an impact on my life and would be more akin to a disability, particularly around the times where you might be having a, a major surgery. And then there are things that, you know, your peer group can do that you can't do. Um, and then I would be more, you know, likely to I guess class it in the disability category but then the other times of my life where I'm, I'm getting on and just kind of living my life without fact having too much of an impact I'd perhaps be less likely to consider it a disability um, but that is the case for many things I guess that, that would be referred to as as disability so I hope that kind of answers the question I, I know it's a it can be quite a sensitive topic um, it is important to point out legally it is because that does also open the avenue for certain funding um, that people are eligible to apply for as well. So it's really important that we give you that information. Um, but yeah, I would say how you choose to self-identify is probably more important than what a legal framework says in this case. Okay, thank you. Thanks for clearing that up a bit um, and sharing your personal views as well. Um, so the next question, um, is how can this paper be a useful tool for health practitioners to improve care for adults born with a cleft lip and or palate? Yeah, well, I think this piece of research is a timely reminder of just how complex and multifaceted cleft is as a condition and how there is much more to cleft treatment than merely treating the physical aspects of cleft and that the emotional and psychosocial side of things needs a lot of attention too. And I, I guess that also kind of gets back at that that disability question perhaps if someone is experiencing quite an adverse effect on their emotional well-being um i mean that's definitely we know that that mental you know ill health is quite disabling for people um and so although this largely sits within the domain of clinical psychologists i hope that it serves as a reminder to all health professionals to prompt and ask a few questions to make sure that we don't miss things um you know like many aspects of cleft care, I think this paper goes to show the value of early intervention as well. You know, if the right supports are given at an early age, perhaps it lessens the need for some of the support later on in life. And it, it's probably a really important distinction, actually, that I always take a bit of time now to make for, for parents who might be watching this, you know, parents of young children, is that actually what your child has access to now and the pathway that they'll experience is quite different to a lot of people who completed our survey um, because it's relatively new. You know, in the last 20 years or so, the clinical psychologists have formed a part of cleft teams in the UK. Um, and it's quite unique to the UK as well. We don't see that in a lot of other countries around the world yet, even though we, we should. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these messages have been heard loud and clear and understood. Um, and now there are early interventions that happen, like everybody who's born today with a cleft in the UK will have access to clinical psychology at key stages of their life growing up. So some of these concerns about relationships perhaps um, can be addressed in that those teenage years rather than when they become a problem in somebody's 20s or, or 30s. Um, we have to recognize though, you know, for Clapper as an organization, um, and particularly in the context of the Adult Services Project, which is where we've done this research, um, that there is a, a very large group of people out there who have not had access to the same treatment and kind of wraparound support that is available now. Um, and like in terms of sheer number, so we've got around about 90,000 people in the UK who were born with a cleft. 72,000 of those are over the age of 18. So by number, that is the largest group of people out there. Now, we did generally find, you know, for younger adults, they reported a higher level of satisfaction with things than older, older adults. 
And what we have to bear in mind is that a lot of older adults, not only did they not have access to psychology, but they may not have had, had a lot of access to any of the other um, allied health services, so speech therapy, orthodontists, um, those sorts of things. Um, and they may have just basically had a primary um, cleft repair surgery and not have had a lot of support since. Um, they may have been told as well that there was nothing more that they can, can have access to, which we now know is not the case. And I would encourage any adults who might um, feel that they're in that category and that have some concerns and have been told years ago that there's nothing more that can be done to get in touch with your GP or get in touch with your local cleft team. You'll find the, the details on our website um, to get back in touch with them um, because you are eligible for treatment in the UK at any age, um, which, which is fantastic, but I, I don't think people necessarily are aware of that. Um, so, you know, when we're going through, through this, we also have to identify not only the things that, you know, can be done at an early age, um, or the things that have already been done, which, you know, we're seeing the benefit of, but also recognizing um, that there is a large group of people out there who have been left without a lot of support and like it's not the cleft journey is not a journey that anybody should have to do by themselves it is a tough journey um and so just for people to know that there is support out there whatever age you are um but yeah equally to provide some reassurance for, for parents watching this um that the journey that that your child is going to go through is one that you know has the benefit of many, many years more experience and understanding of how theft impacts on much more than just, you know, the physical side of things. And they're, they're really good nowadays at providing that support early on in life so that these things don't become as much of an issue for people. Thank you. Um, and a question that lots of people might want to know the answer to here is what can friends and family members do to support a child, young person or adult who was born with a cleft? Yeah, I think this was another really good question. Um, one of the most common things I hear from people when they're describing their relationships with people is they say that they appreciate being treated just like anyone else, um, which of course makes a lot of sense. We all want to be treated like anybody else as much as we can. I'm um, indicating to people that you're ready to listen and have a conversation with somebody about their cleft if they want to, but not expecting them to have to open up to you is really important. Um, so like just being quite genuine and that being prepared to listen, but but not being overly curious, if that makes sense, you know. Um, people all manage this in a different way. Some people will want to talk about it, others won't, and that's fine. Um, and you as a support person, don't get to choose or decide what is right or wrong here. Um, even if the person's decision may frustrate you, you need to let people get there in their own time, and, and, and they will. And I think this is especially important as well for parents thinking about their children. Um, particularly perhaps through teenage years where people have to make big decisions about future treatment perhaps. Um, and they, you know, a teenager has a lot on their plate as it is without having to think about kind of a major surgery or treatment option. And so while it might frustrate you that they've not got there as quickly as you have, you just have to, to work with them and you know not try and force that upon upon them because that that is the point where people will start to shut down and not talk to you about things and that's where it will harm you know the relationship that they've got with you so um just being quite genuine in, in that um a way that i've heard someone describe this and i would tend to agree is that living with cleft can be pretty intense and we don't necessarily expect others to fully grasp the intensity of this um but an understanding from other people that this journey can be intense and being kind and supportive goes a long way. Um, whether that be by being that listening ear that doesn't attempt to solve all the problems, but rather just actively listens, or whether it be offering a welcome distraction when someone is feeling a bit overwhelmed, um, attempting to understand and relate as best you can is really important. Um, as a friend and especially so as a partner, um, understanding the anxiety that people have is really important. A lot of people report feeling worried that they weren't good enough for their partner and they were worried that their partner would leave them. Now, 
I'm pretty confident if I spoke to their partners, they would not say anything other than that they loved the person who was born with a cleft very much and that they wished that they could see themselves in the way that they saw them. But nevertheless, it's a real worry for people. It, it's a genuine anxiety. And it, it can be really tempting to dismiss this for people by saying something like, oh, don't be silly. But actually, it may be really important to understand here that this is anxiety talking. Anxiety doesn't have a great reputation for being particularly rational. Um, and so that could be a really genuine fear for people. So try and talk this through with your partner or friend and understand what it is that is making them concerned and what would help to reassure them. Um, it may well be beyond your help. And again, this is where the cleft team psychologist may be the best person to be involved and to support with this. So gentle encouragement to re-engage with the cleft service could be really useful here as well. Great, thank you. Um, and we've got lots of time, so I'm going to start scrolling back through the live comments now. So give me one minute. Um, yeah, lots of people saying hi. That's really great. Um, so going back to the discussion around bullying and, dis bullying and discrimination, we've got a comment from someone saying that is very interesting about not believing they have been bullied. I've just come out of counselling age 36 and talked about things that happened to me, but I didn't mention at the time as it didn't feel big enough at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything to what you've already said about that. Yeah, um, I mean, that that is a really interesting scenario. And I, I think it is often only when we reflect back that we can identify some of these things um and, and i mean the, the story that this person tells is certainly not unusual um you know to kind of discover these things in, in their 30s 40s or you know e even later in life um and i think you know that bullying and discrimination like we were saying it takes its toll in, in different ways um i mean i certainly look back on my own experiences as well and i think there were things that at the time um I probably should have been more concerned about or should have sought support on, but you just don't necessarily, A, have the, the knowledge to identify that's what's happening to you, um, or B, have the skill, skills to know how to deal with it. I, I think the thing is though, it can have that impact later on in life and making sure that if it is something that's bothering you later in life, um, that you do seek some support for that and talk that through with somebody um, because it it can start to get in the way of things if it's kind of left unaddressed and if you're feeling you know particularly upset or aggrieved by an incident that, that happened earlier in life um, I mean there are a couple of things actually that came up in the, the survey that were of particular concern um, which I wrote about in the lay summary as well um, where we you know, somewhat people, we asked people to describe what had happened to them in terms of bullying and, and discrimination. Um, and there were a couple of instances which we would, as authors of the paper, identify as sexual assault. Um, but obviously that had gone unreported because the person hadn't used those words themselves, but it was just the very explicit description of what had happened. That is how it would be interpreted. And, and so, you know, there are, there's obviously a big underreporting issue here as well. And we know that generally with, you know, things that people are, are victim to in society, particularly, um, you know, things like sexual abuse or, or assault often doesn't get reported. Um, it was just really sad to see that happening in our community and that people hadn't identified necessarily that's what had happened to them. Or if they had, they didn't feel comfortable to use those words to describe it um, and I think that probably is indicative of an unmet psychological need there as well um, as well as of course you know the need the desperate need for society to change its attitude yeah definitely um, another question for the speech therapy session, I was 35 years old. Mine was done at the Birmingham Children's Hospital. How come I was not referred to as adult speech language therapy? 
Mm. That is a good question. And I know that different tech teams do this differently. Um, I mean, the most likely reason I can think of is because even as an adult, um, when you're going back for speech therapy, you want to be going through the cleft team um, and seeing the cleft team speech therapist. It may well be in this case um, that that just happens to be based at the children's hospital. And I, and I believe actually in Birmingham um, that a lot of the adult services um, are done through the, the children's hospital because it's where the cleft team is based and you want to have access to those expertise. Um, a lot of cleft teams do do a clinic in the adults hospital and move between them. Um, but I know there are regions of the UK where because they've got everything set up in the children's hospital because the, the majority of patients are children um, that they do um, see you in that same same area and I know that's happened for me um, in London as well when I went in for to see the actual cleft team um, that was done through the Evelina children's hospital bit they give you a, a kind of a separate place to, to wait and things like that but it is it's where the cleft team are based and they've got got their offices so um, it's quite usual if that happens um, and it's far better to be going through the cleft team speech therapist than a general one who doesn't have that cleft experience um, so I, I do get though it, it can feel a bit uncomfortable having to go into a children's hospital as, as an adult. Um, it's, it's not ideal and it's, it's something that we have fed back to the cleft teams as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like it's the same in Manchester as well. We've just got a comment from someone saying that adult services are at the children's hospital in Manchester too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just going to find some other questions. Um, so going on to the genetic testing um, kind of area of the findings, we've got a comment from someone saying, myself and my mum have both got a cleft. They told me it was probably my mum being on a certain medication. I have three daughters and none with it, but my daughters have a 10% chance. Um, I don't know if you can shine any light or reply to that or. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, great. So that's an example of someone who's gone through genetic counselling by the sounds of things and they've worked out that probability of someone. I think as, as well, you know, um, what's been touched on, sorry, Kate, did they, they say both them and their, their mother had that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think what's probably happened here is we, we've touched on a really classic example of genes plus environment, you know, like um, the fact that that mum had it. Um, you know, so there's obviously some genetic component there, but then the, the question around the, the medication as well is an environmental factor. And, and this is, is quite typical of what happens with cleft. It's one thing plus something else um, or plus multiple things. Um, and then obviously if that environmental factor, you know, if, if it was indeed the medication had a role to play here, um, that by removing that, um, in terms of this lady having her own children, um, then that's reduced the risk by, a, you know, down to 10% or, or whatever. Um, and I, I think, you know, risks around the sort of 10% mark are, are not uncommon. Um, generally, it's, it's somewhere around 1 in 50-ish, but, it, you know, it, it can be quite a bit bit higher than that. And, you know, 1, one in 10 is not hugely higher than that, really, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but yeah, it is why I would encourage people to look at the option of genetic counselling. Mm -hmm. um, while we're on this topic, there's a few really nice comments I just want to read out. Um, so we've got one saying, me and my son were both born with a bilateral cleft lip and palate. I was never told the percentage, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I feel like he was handpicked just for me. And then someone else has said, love this. I feel exactly the same about my daughter who was born with a unilateral cleft lip and palate. Um, okay. Then... Oh, another lovely one. Might as well read out all the lovely comments. Um, someone said, hi, I'm also a cleft lip baby. I was bullied at school. Of course, I didn't take it well, but that made me stronger and embraced my beautiful smile more. What great yeah, that, that is a really good point. And thank you all for sharing such lovely feedback. Um, <clears throat> it's really nice to know that, that what we found and, and talk about resonates with people. Um, but that is something I, I haven't spoken a, a lot about in here is that, you know, a, a proportion of people um, 
a reasonable proportion of people did report a sense of resilience, you know, in the longer term, so that things were difficult, perhaps early on in life, and they maybe didn't, you know, like we were saying before, have the skills perhaps to deal with it or, or feel that comfortable to deal with it. But they reported that it set them up better, you know, better in later life to deal with things um, as they came up. And um, I have certainly seen a lot of people say that, and I've seen a lot of examples of that, where people who were born with clefts or, or other, you know, health conditions that require quite a lot of um, difficult stuff early on in life, um, then seem to be a little bit better at taking other things that life throws your way in your stride. Um, that's, of course, the reason I haven't stated it particularly loudly is it's really important to recognise that's not the case for everybody. And I don't want to set an expectation that you should become resilient just because you've gone through something difficult, because we, we know that doesn't happen for a lot of people um, and that that's why those ongoing supports in adulthood are really important um, so just to validate however you're feeling is fine and there is support available like so if you feel you know like you've dealt with cleft and kind of have, have put it in some sort of perspective that works for you um, and you've developed a sense of resilience and that you don't need further support that's great we're not saying that you're denying something or that that you need support you know that that's excellent and ideally we'd like more people to feel that way um but equally if you're feeling like you know you've had quite a rough time um and that you know things are quite difficult well know that there's a lot of other people who have felt that way too and that is why the support is there is to support you know when you're feeling like that and to to hopefully make you feel you know in better stead to to kind of work through these things as they as they come up um but yeah thank you again for those those comments it's really nice to, to hear mm -hmm. yeah and we've got a few people agreeing now as you were just saying that um about resilience um let me find another question for you um we've got a few people sharing um experiences you know you were talking about um like differences internationally areas for further research um, so someone's unfortunately had some bad experiences going to the US um, and they were shouted at while on holiday and they've said, but I guess there are mean people everywhere. And yeah, I think that's definitely true. And someone else said cultural issues are huge for all of us. As an old adult in the US, it's interesting to see what exists. My family was superstitious, which brought shame to me. And um, so I guess that reiterates the point you were making that actually that is something that should be looked into more like more research could definitely benefit there yeah i mean definitely i mean what, what we're seeing there is probably a combination of, of different cultural practice perhaps but but also that the age thing um i mean I, unfortunately i i've not got a lot of experience with the us system um and i've, I've not not lived there myself um but i i do know that the way that healthcare for cleft is managed is very different to that of the UK. Um, and therefore the support that might be available to someone is quite different, you know, and I know, you know, from, from the little I know about how the US works, I know it's an insurance-based healthcare system. Um, so it's not like the NHS where it's kind of, you know, available to everybody free of charge. Like it's, you know, depending on your level of coverage, what you'll be able to access. Um, and so I think this is where those, you know, international studies are really important um, because I, I wouldn't want to, to pass judgment on what that might mean for somebody growing up, up with a cleft, um, but it certainly will have an impact which is different from, from systems like the UK, um, you know, and, and other countries um, where healthcare is, is free at the point of, of access. Yeah, and I think the same person's just commented saying that they've done well, they've retired after 47 years um, as a nurse, is that? and 30 years as an advanced practice nurse, nurse practitioner in a wonderful marriage, which is lovely. That is lovely to hear, and look, they, they will have far more expertise than I will about the US healthcare <laughs> system in that case. So um, again, thanks very much for, for tuning in and 
mm -hmm. joining us. Yeah. And I, I think actually this highlights, um, and it's something we found with, with Cleft Talk as well, that actually there's not a lot of this internationally happening. Like this adult services project that Clapper has done is kind of a world first, really. Um, and I think the engagement we're seeing not only within the UK, but from around the world is testament to how important this piece of work is and, and how how overdue the support for adults is. So it's really nice to be opening the dialogue um, and to have people joining us from, from all over the world to share their experiences because um, there is far more that, that unites us than divides us on this journey, depending on where we are in the world. Um, and so I think it's nice to have this collective voice be, be quite strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when you were talking about, um, I think this was at the point you were talking about, like accessing further support and everything. We've got someone just saying, that's really good to hear. They haven't been to their local craft team in about 15 years. And they were told that they didn't have access to them. So they'll talk to their GP now, they've said, which is really great. And just on that note, we've got resources that like, you know, you are very much entitled to go back to the cleft team. Um, but it's important for me to, to point out, and I think I pointed it out in a, a previous Q&A on, on physical health. Um, and it will certainly come up again in our next Q&A on treatment experiences. Um, just because the you are entitled to it, unfortunately, it doesn't mean it's necessarily easy to get that first appointment. Um, and that is where we're, we're here to help. We've put together an actual letter that you can take to the GP um, that outlines the part of the NHS, it's called the service specification, um, which highlights um, in black and white, in plain English, that anybody of any age is entitled to cleft care. Um, the cleft teams all know this, but it can be a bit hit or miss as to whether your GP or your dentist knows this. Um, and there have certainly been instances of people being referred to the wrong wrong place um, so if you ever do if anyone listening to this um, in the uk contacts your gp um, or your general dentist and has difficulty getting a referral or is told you're not eligible for a referral um, do get in touch with us email us adults at clapper.com um, we will send you through the letter template that you can take with you um, to the gp um, and like the response i've had to that from gps is that actually that's a very useful tool because um, it's just you know closed a gap in their knowledge that they just weren't aware of because your average GP probably doesn't see a lot of adult cleft patients to be completely honest. Um, so yeah, anything we can do to support um, that, you know, that is is what we're here for because it's it can be a little bit difficult sometimes. Um, your other option, of course, is to you'll find all the cleft team details on our website. Um, by all means, phone them and have a chat with them about getting back in. They'll also tell you what you need to do and support you to get back in to, to see them as well. Great. Thank you, Kenny. Um, I'm not actually sure if you've already kind of answered this question, so I'll read it out just in case. Um, someone said, I had speech and language therapy um, at age 28 at the Birmingham Children's Hospital. How come I wasn't referred to adult speech and language therapy? Um, because I was an adult, there was no support and limited for small sessions. Um, so I'm not sure if you've already touched on that when you were talking about the adult services at children's hospitals before. Mm. I, I think what, what they're maybe also getting at a second issue here, which, which is worth talking about particularly also at the moment is very relevant in the context of COVID, which, which is a service provision issue. So yes, you are entitled to return um, and to have an assessment. Um, how they, you know, the, the treatment that is then offered to you is obviously somewhat at the discretion of the cleft team. Um, different cleft teams have different priorities as to um, kind of where things sit for them um, and for what, you know, get seen more quickly and things. I know like some areas, you know, um, prioritize adult psychology, for example, for the reasons we've mentioned that there's actually a very large group out there of people who, who aren't supported or haven't had that support, I should say. Um, yeah, in terms of the limiting to a number of sessions, um, it is disappointing, obviously, if you feel that that hasn't been enough and that you need more. Um, <clears throat> 
you can always seek a second opinion. That's something that everybody is entitled to do. And the way to do that is to phone any other cleft team um, and say that you would like to come in for a second opinion um, and they will assess you. They won't necessarily agree to treat you, um, but they will certainly give you an assessment and provide recommendations as to whether they agree or disagree with what your cleft team has recommended for you in terms of treatment. Um, it is also worth mentioning with COVID at the moment, unfortunately, um, a lot of cleft treatment is on hold. Um, and unfortunately that, and concerningly to me, obviously, it, it's just proportionately affecting adults. Um, like adults is the thing that um, seems to have gone on the back burner with COVID as they've had to kind of make some difficult decisions about what's priority. And like, of course, nobody wants to take anything away from from children but I, I would like to make sure that we don't um end up kind of not getting back to where we we need to be as a result of COVID and I, I think it's some some work that FAPA will will work very closely with the cleft teams to to make sure that um that adult voice continues to be heard and that adult treatment um continues to be available for all those who need it. Great. Thank you. Let me just find another one. Um, just read through. So we've got someone um, saying, would you say having a cleft contributes to diversity? And they've put diversity in sort of quote marks. Hmm. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a, a really interesting question. I, again, I think there's people's self perceptions um, that are at play here. Um, I mean, definitely visible difference is something that we've spoken about. And we know that, you know, appearance differences and speech differences do impact on how people can be perceived by others. Um, and so in terms of, like, I would encourage anybody when they're thinking about diversity, um, particularly in like a, a workplace context, for example, um, that these are things you need to consider, you know, people who um, may have, you know, an appearance difference or who may sound different and think about the kind of um, discrimination that, that they might face or the harassment that they might endure as a result of these things. And what are you doing as an employer or as an event organizer or as a school to safeguard people from that, you know, to minimize the risk of that? Um, the other really important thing to mention here, um, which I think fits nicely with diversity, is kind of the, the cumulative effect of differences. So, so for example, um, you know, having cleft is one thing, but if you also are, you know, um, identify as a person of colour um, or, you know, are a woman or are part of the LGBTQIA community, um, you will also face prejudices by being part of those groups and parts of the community as well. And that, unfortunately, it, it adds on top of, you know, other differences as well. So um, I think, you know, there's often real issues for people when you kind of have two or three things start adding on top of each other. Um, and, you know, it, it harps back to my earlier point of how society's attitudes need to change for a lot of this to be, be addressed in a, a really fair and meaningful way. Um, but being aware of those for people, like not assuming that, you know, um, one person will experience one type of discrimination um, just because of one factor, recognizing that, you know, people with multiple factors, it's likely that, uh, it's very unfortunate, but it is likely that they will experience multiple types of discrimination. Um, and so, you know, those people would be more at risk than say someone who's got one risk factor. Um, so like me, for example, being born with a cleft, but, you know, otherwise being a straight white male, that's a lot of things going in my favor. Um, but perhaps if some of those other factors were different for me, um, I would expect to experience more discrimination on top of the discrimination I was experiencing for being born with a cleft. Does that kind of make sense? Sorry, it's kind of a roundabout answer. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point that you just made. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, 
then yeah we've got a comment from someone going back to the section on bullying um, and they've said I don't think we see bullying clearly as young children it's later when we figure out that the mean kid was a bully and get the implications and I think that really echoes a lot of what you've been saying actually throughout this Q&A. Definitely definitely and I think there is a lot of you know and particularly I, I mean I'm looking back to my own kind of adolescent and pre-adolescent years um, and I think we've got a, a word for a lot of the behavior that that happens now and the word I would use would be gaslighting where you're kind of made to feel that you know there's something wrong with you or that you're not good at something or not as worthy of, of as other people and it, it comes back to that you know if everybody treated each other as we would like to be treated um you know the world would be a better place but i i think that is a real issue because you can particularly if you're you know if it's happening to you often enough you can start to believe that and then and then this belief cycle that you don't deserve all the things that you deserve um and then that manifests itself in different ways later in life so i think you know the person who's written that is absolutely right it is often when we often only when we reflect back later on that we identify what we experienced was bullying and like i, I now look back at the people who are doing the bullying and kind of can identify some of their own risk factors for you know that kind of made them fall into that perhaps you know made them fall into that that category you know things like um yeah a lot of them didn't have great relationships with you know peers and family and things like that and so i think that also harks back to the point of you know what can everybody do to support people with cleft it's like you know making sure that we're supporting every child growing up and making sure that as a society we value that people have the necessities of life um because you know people who who don't are not only at risk of being bullied but also of becoming bullies themselves yeah definitely um we've now got a question about um like support from that you can get from your cleft team so someone's asked um does the extra support extend to dental care my dentist said clefts are associated with weaker enamel which would explain the dozens of fillings inlays crowns etc i've had over the years and it gets expensive um, I don't think I've ever had a cleft team. I only had one operation at three months old back in the 1970s. And again, echoes what you've been saying about this Q&A. Yeah, a, a really good question. Um, and one that we will cover in great detail in the next q and in, in May about treatment experiences. But to answer that quickly, yes, it does extend to dental care. And, and yes, the observations that your dentist has made are very much supported by the, the evidence. Um, the issue can be um, getting that referral again. Your dentist can make a referral to the, the cleft team dentist and probably should if they believe that um, the dental issues you're having are as a result of, of cleft. Um, there's a lot of restorative dentistry um, that can be, be done and is available free of charge on the, the NHS if it is related to to cleft um, and making that distinction can sometimes be hard. Um, we do have another resource um, which could be very useful to you, um, which is our um, teething issues episode of our cleft talk podcast. So if you go to clapper.com forward slash cleft talk, I think it's episode nine, it'll be very clear anyway on, on the website um, where we actually speak with um, a general dentist um, and also a restorative dentist who's working in the CLEF team as well about what you can expect your general dentist to do and what you can expect um, to be referred to the CLEF team for. Um, so I would really encourage you to, to have a listen to that if you are having some difficulties with, with dental um, stuff and getting those referrals, but also tune into our next Q&A um, towards the end of May where we'll talk about this in, in more detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a similar comment from someone else. Well, not similar, it's a different issue, but that they've asked and emailed and called her, um, her dental practitioner to ask for a referral to the CLEF team. They look as if they're really confused um, and as yet haven't done that. Um, and they've been asking for years and they've just said it's fascinating to hear about the possibility to get into the, like, the system via other routes. So I guess everything that you've just said kind of answers that 
question as well, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, definitely I, in that scenario for, for that person, I, I would encourage them now to just phone the cleft team um, and explain they've been, been trying. Um, your other option, of course, is you can go to your GP and get your GP to do it. It doesn't matter who does it, if it's your GP or your dentist, either of them can refer for any service. Um, and then if, if you continue to get stuck, drop us an email, adults at clapper.com and we'll see what we can do to, to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's lots of lovely comments on here about cleft teams being amazing and things like that. Um, and then we've got one, where do I go to get my genetics tested? I'm the only one in my family to have one. So while it hasn't been genetic so far, does that mean it might be now? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, and is it exactly what the genetic counselling is is for. Um, what it, it does seem to be is that there's an element of truth in that, that once you have a cleft, um, your chance of your child having a cleft, even if there's no other kind of factors at play, is higher than um, it would be had you not had a cleft so if you, you don't have, if no one's got a cleft the, the average is about one in 700 and um, if you do have a, a cleft and no other factors that rises to about one in 50 so again like we're talking very small numbers but actually it, it, it's a reasonable jump um in terms of where you can go to get genetic testing um you organize that through your cleft team so usually the genetic counseling side of things is something you'll be sent somewhere different in the hospital to have because they kind of, um, they are part of the cleft team, but they also are part of many other teams. So they kind of sit on the periphery a bit, um, but get in touch with your cleft team um, and ask that. If you don't have a cleft team, get in touch with your GP and ask for a referral to the cleft team for genetic counseling. And they should be able to organize that, that for you. Um, again, I would encourage watching that, that cleft talk episode, episode two, um, which explains a lot more about how if you have had a cleft um, and no one else in your family has, kind of what that that means for you going forward. And it, it's mostly reassuring good news, like that, you know, like I don't want to worry anyone <laughs> unnecessarily. Like the, the general thing is like it's it's a slight increase, um, but actually it's still around that one in 50 mark, which is probably not enough to get too worried, but um yeah, do, do seek out genetic counselling um, if it's something you're, you're interested in, in knowing. I, I know for me personally, it, it would be something I would, would want to know. Thank you, Kenny. Um, someone's asked, can you get a second opinion from any other cleft team in the UK, regardless of where you live? It's a really interesting question. Yes, you, you can. Obviously, the thing with that is if you choose one that's, um, you know, if you're in... Um, Salisbury and you want to go and get the Glasgow cleft team you're, you're going to have to travel for that so um, generally we would recommend you go for the neighbouring cleft team simply because it's easier for you to get to um, but if you would rather go to another one for a second opinion um, that, that is your right to do so. Thank you um, yeah then we've got a few comments saying things like um, a lot of work is being done in primary schools now about bullying so hopefully children with clefts now shouldn't experience this like they used to which is really great and yeah hopefully that is the case. Um, a few people are asking if this will be available to view later yes and um, so when we do a live video it should save to our Facebook page and can be watched later and we'll also upload it to our website as well a recording and um, so you will be able to watch later. Um, another really interesting question. Someone's asked, are there any articles or resources to show a partner of someone with a cleft? My partner has never really come into contact with cleft affected people. And while I talk about my own experiences, it would be useful to show more. Um, I guess a starting point for this question would be all the stories that have been shared by lots of wonder pe wonderful people from the Clapper community, like adult stories that we have on our website. And I can put a link in the chat now, but Kenny, do you want to add anything if you know of any articles? Yeah, I mean, I would I would also direct them to the, the Clapper website. There's a lot of resources on there. I think, uh, you know, depending on um, what specifically they would like to find out more about, I think the Cleft Talk um, episodes are really good as well. Like we very much design them with a, um, a more broad audience in mind so not only adults with cleft but actually the people around those are adults with cleft um i think as well um 
I mean, if, if it's kind of they want to re read research these stuff, um, obviously the articles themselves delve into this quite a bit, particularly the one that this paper, uh, that this lay summary is based around. Um, but also, yeah, I, I mean, we haven't seen a lot of this go through our peer support service, but it, it would be something that um, if someone had particular questions um, that they wanted to ask a member of our, our CLEF community, I can't see a reason why that wouldn't be, be available. Um, but yeah, start on the CLEF website, have a, a read through people's stories. Um, but yeah, if there's kind of a specific question or set of questions in mind, um, you might be best to get in touch with us and kind of um, we can point you in the direction of specific information. Yeah, yeah, I've put a few links on there now, but as Kenny said, if you do have any difficulties finding anything, just let us know. And anyone can always email info at clapper.com anytime. So yeah, definitely let us know. Um, let's see if there are any more, because I'm also aware that it's been over an hour. Um, so let's have a look. Um, a few people saying thank you. Um, so I'm just going to read out um, a comment here. Someone said, I'm 46 and spent most of my life with bullies as I have ginger hair, but nothing was worse than the stuff said to me about my looks. Um, they had a cleft, um, after a cleft lip and palate. After all the ops I've had, you would not know now people tend to think I've been in a fight and got bottled. I've become a strong hearted person due to what I was born with and what I had to go through, yet people tend to forget um, what my parents and brother went through on this journey with me. They made me so strong. Um, and that's a nice, um, I guess, like awful that this person's had these experiences, but also an important, important point they've made about um, like friends and family and how they're part of that journey too and how best that they can support. Yeah, um, that is a really good, good observation they've made there and something that actually I, I haven't spoken a lot about in the um the q a today because it, it was a really kind of positive and pretty um ubiquitous finding that people reported um receiving a lot of support from from family and friends but but family especially um and that is something that um seems to be reasonably um widespread among the CLEF community that people feel that the support they've had from their their family has been really good and absolutely you know people's families have gone through a lot with them as well and it's not easy on on anybody and you know parents and, and siblings you know go through this journey together so um it, it's key to people's developing that sense of resilience i think is having those positive environments at home and the, the support there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone said that they're 44 and they only discovered Clapper last year. Hi and <laughs> welcome. We're really glad you're welcome. here. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of appreciation for cleft teams and surgeons and everything going on in the comments, which is really great. Um, but I think we'll probably, given that it's been over an hour and I'm conscious of time, I think we'll probably wrap up here. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess we'll just say thank you so much for June, um, for can't speak now. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for tuning in and for sharing your experiences and asking questions. Um, yeah, it's always really great doing these Q and A's because everything that everyone contributes kind of makes them what they are. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everyone who will be watching this video later on as well. Um, so I'll add the link to the research summary again in the comments, just in case anyone wants to recap there. And we've put the CLEF talk um, link there as well. And as Kenny said, it's really worth checking out. Um, yeah, so we hope you found this session really interesting. Um, and thank you very much for joining us, Kenny. I don't know if you want to say any last words. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can say echo that really. Thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be able to come and talk about the research with you guys. Because, like, and again, you know, my appreciation to all the people who took part in the research and who have enabled us to to open this conversation. Um, and like I say, it's really nice to get the feedback that what we're sharing resonates with people. Um, it lets us know we're on the the right track, and we'll keep moving forward in the right direction. Absolutely. So from both of us, 
thank you so much for joining us and good night. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye.